So much needs fixing around the globe. Do you draw the line and next door? You and I, all that's broken. It is time for We Act Radio's Conversations Toward Repair. Welcome. This is We Act Radio broadcasting from historic Anacostia, Washington, D.C., land that was once home to the Nacochtank people, sometimes called Anacostans, who were displaced within about 40 years of Europeans arriving. Anacostia is again facing displacement as new buildings and uh, luxury apartments are taking the place of long-standing residents and businesses. Um, I am Virginia Avniel Spatz, and this is a new series I'm calling Conversations Toward Repair. I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, in just a moment. And I, uh, I, I want to say that my intention in this series is to focus on undoing violence by exploring many forms of violence embedded in our city, nation, and globe that frequently go unremarked so we can highlight ways of building peace. And I'm going to uh, pause for just a moment to put um, Brother Dr. Toyin back in our, our uh, stream here and I'm going to add also Simone Freeman. I will uh, introduce them momentarily. I did want to start out, this is a brand new series, this is our second show, and I do want to just start by saying that it's still International Month of Action Against AFRICOM and you can find out about that by going to weactradio.com and looking at the resources there. I want to thank again Netfer Freeman of Black Alliance for Peace for joining our first episode and also I want to thank again uh, our guests from Peace for DC who came to the first episode to talk about ways of addressing trauma so that we address violence um, in our city and in other places. And there are links to that work there as well. And so I am delighted to introduce my guests for this week, who are brother Dr. Toyin Agbetu, an educator and founder of the London-based organization Legali. I hope I said that right. And sure. um, Kimon Freeman, who probably our um, listeners know, uh, is co-founder of We Act Radio, founder of the Black Love Festival, author, artist, and friend. And I learned about brother Dr. Toyin due to the wonders of the internet where video of his 2007 protest at Westminster Abbey was being recirculated during the funeral for Queen Elizabeth the second, and I learned about his work um, just through the internet and thought that it would be great to have him come and uh, speak directly. And before I turn the mic over to uh, D Brother Dr. Toyan, I want to uh, just mention that he and I arranged this show before the recent hullabaloo mm -hmm. U.S. over celebrity anti-Semitic comments and response to it. And so this program was not originally meant to focus on that. But Kimon and I, as a Black non-Jew and a non-Black Jew, often talk about this intersection of anti-Black racism and anti-Semitism and how they are weaponized against each other. And so we thought we had to address this situation, even though I think it is less um, less of a deal in um, in Britain. And so I'm extra grateful to Brother Dr. Toyin for allowing us to include this topic on um, a show that was originally designed to um, to focus more directly on the work of Legali. And also, as, as we get into it, um, justice for Chris Kaba, who is a victim of um, police violence, uh, similar to situations we've seen here in DC and around the globe. So let me stop talking for a minute and I'll um, ask um, 
Brother Dr. Toyin, just to say anything else you want to say, just as welcome, and then I'll give Kimona a moment to also also speak. Well, uh, thank you for that warm uh, invitation and uh, salutations. Uh, you know, so greetings, Virginia. Greetings, Kama. It's 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 wonderful to be invited onto your program, and uh, I love the name We Act Radio. <clears throat> Action is, is something that people are often frightened of and like you know we often hear about talk radio and uh people don't make the, the connection that actually speech is good and speech is powerful but it you know for it to be meaningful um when we're talking about social injustices it has to move to action so we act radio is kind of like a very powerful affirmation in the face of uh, a lot of talk radio stations that just cause trouble drop scud bombs everywhere and actually don't actually help solve the problem so it's it's, it's a pleasure to be invited um, to have a discussion with you, and uh, and and also I, I should say, what you just said about um, you know you invited me before um, this uh, fiasco came about with uh, Kanye West. Um, you know I, I do want to say I I find it incredibly humbling that you actually checked in with me um, to decide you know to just to check that I was okay whether I'd be okay being on the program um, because that is part of the problem that. Um, often people silence themselves and they have to censor themselves. I have to be sensitive and I, I'll say that now um, because of the situation. But the moment I can't speak truth, um, something's wrong. And so as a scholar activist, as a Pan-Africanist, uh, truth, justice, action, freedom, liberty, uh, all these kind of things are, are kind of like in my blood. That's what I've got to do. So it's wonderful to be in a space where we can not I, I clearly don't like talking about you know so-called celebrities, but I don't want to run away from particular issues, and then we can get onto substantive issues um, as well afterwards. Well, thank you, and I'm kind of laughing because, um, Kimon, um, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit more? And um, Kimon is always telling me truth is our product. So, <laughs> with yes. that, with you, I'm I'm just thinking you two have a lot in common. So, uh, Kimon, you want to add anything to your introduction, or just say hello? I'm not hearing you. No, still, still, uh, we we have Kimon Freeman on the air, but we're not getting his audio feed. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, I was connected to the car, so I guess um, Elon Musk was trying to silence me here. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's an honor to have this brother up here, this culture warrior up here. And one thing that you omitted in his introduction is his role as an artist, because I've been listening to uh, Shades of Black um, this morning and have been quite uh, impressed with the um, the quality of, the, of his um, uh, musical um, prowess. And I just want to thank this brother because um, when I saw the film and I saw the footage, I was like, oh, he's a badass, you know, and we need more of that. We Like, why is it always the onus on us to be so polite, like this respectability politics? Because, you know, the whole talk, like, you know, if only if our kids, you know, was more respectful and if they just pull their pants up, you know, like I have to tell people, look, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X wore suits every day of their lives. And how were they treated? <laughs> so that was so we out the door with that. So I felt that um, his disruption and we at we at Korea, we try to use disruption as a business model to see his disruption of that um, ceremony, that insidious um, ceremony that was uh, uh, sanitized uh, and, and whitewashed uh, was inspiring. And um, at the same time, it was infuriating to see the number of Africans that sat there and let this brother stand on his own and be uh, uh, accosted and, and, and walked out uh, was breaking my heart because I feel like, and I want to frame this question to my brother, but um, first let me say that, that even though I was disappointed and brokenhearted to see that level of cognitive dissonance in our people there, it was also reaffirming to see the support he got after the fact. Uh, I think they turned in it, the, the film was um, The Walk. And in the opening of The Walk, uh, the film opens with this statement, and I'll leave it here. It says, this film 
uh, this film, uh, Afrocentric ideology and spiritual vibes, which may awake revolutionary actions. There go that word action again. And otherwise passive people. It was like a warning label. And I thought all that was beautiful. So I want I want to leave that at the at the, uh, the foot of my brother to say, why do you think white supremacy as a 500 year institution has been so effective in whether it's cognitive dissonance, where it's outright uh, uh, um, passive, uh, you know, the, the, the whitewashing of history. Why do you think that institutional white supremacy has been so effective over the minds of so many people for so long? I mean, thank you, brother. I mean, that's that's, uh, that's a very humbling um, introduction. Um, I, I'm just going to answer the question because I can't. I, I'll start blushing if you if I talk about some of that stuff. Your question's a really important one. Um, why is it so effective? Well, the truth is, is because it works. White supremacy is probably the most violent, the most vicious, psychopathic system that humans have ever devised. Um, you know, there's only been one group of people. Um, you know, humans of European heritage that have actually used nuclear weapons on human beings, not once, but twice, just for fun. I mean, they justify it saying that Pearl Harbor and all the rhetoric and stuff like this, but they, they, they just wanted to test it. They just wanted to see what had happened. Even in the UK, this small, tiny little island, which is kind of like the birthplace of uh, much of the white supremacist ideology, certainly the empirical and, uh, and, and, and imperialist uh, ideologies that we see around the world today, um, you know, we have a nuclear deterrent. I say we, not as part of the collective, but as someone who's of British nationality. So, you know, the, the deal is, if someone strikes the UK, we have uh, 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 you know, these submarines called Trident submarines, and they will launch missiles at the, at the country, the nation of the people who launched the attack. Now, you've got to understand what kind of sickness you have to be <laughs> to have plans like that in, in mind. They call it a deterrent. What you're saying is that even if you are obliterated and you're dead, you are so spiteful, you are so vicious that you will not just send out crack troops to, to find the people that launched the attack. No, 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 no. You will launch nuclear missiles to obliterate entire nations of people. That, that kind of aggression brings about fear in people. It brings it, it, it means, I mean, America is part of this equation because not only is it military powerful, but culturally it's powerful. So it, it, it does this double, you talk about cognitive dissonance and, 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 and Du Bois talk about the, the you know, double consciousness. And, you know, he's right. So does Franz Fanon talk about these things? Because on one level, you're kind of like seeing this warlike mentality that's psychotic and that's murderous. And it doesn't, it never fails to act and on the other side, you're seeing uh, this cultural output. You're seeing like friends, we will be your friends. You know, you're 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 seeing like uh, peep cartoons like SpongeBob. You're you're seeing uh, like this image of a people. You know, Marvel films. And I I'm a, I'm a nerd, right? I love sci-fi. I, I you know you know I love comics. But you're seeing kind of like yeah, we gotta come together and save the world. And you're seeing this nobility. And so your mind is saying, no, hold on, hold on. If there's an attack, we want these people on our side. They're going to save us. And yet your mind knows that actually this is the same uh, spiritual collective that is murdering innocent people on the street, not because they're a threat, but just because they can. So what happens is that if you live in that world and you have any sense of intelligence, your human being, your number one program is to survive. Every human wants to survive. And so you have to use a level of intelligence to isolate and identify the threat. And so, I, I mean, I sometimes use America as an example, and it's not always fair, but because it parades itself as one of the most militarized nations in the world, um, many people align to the American identity, not because they're proud of the nation's history, but because they're the winners, because they have the power. If Africa had nuclear weapons, I mean, unfortunately, when Nelson Mandela came in, and he gave the weapons away. And I'm not a person who says that we should have nuclear weapons, but when he gave the weapons away and left our continent, our motherland, undefended, and so we still have the same mess uh, since, you know, kind of like, a, that's another story for another day. And then I hear you've been dealing with the African problem, so the expansion of the American empire continues. If, if But let's talk about a different universe. 
if Africa, and I'm saying I'm not a violent person, I'm a Malcolm man, so I believe only, with violence only for self-defense. I don't believe in incursions. But if Africa had that military power, it had, and it could back it up, and then it had its economic uh, power, political power, because people wouldn't mess with it because it had military power. What would happen is that people would be, they would be running to claim that they are African. But unfortunately, people know that when the push comes to the shove, you know, when 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 war strikes and these nations, whether it be a, you know, Germany, whether it be a Britain, whether it be you know a, a, you know America, whether it be Israel, the only reason why they are in, continuing on with their oppressive behaviors is because they can, because they have this 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 arsenal of death. And as an anthropologist, one of the things I have to always remind my students is that we must never conflate mechanization with civilization. We often think that having technology makes us civilized. Having a, you know, a, a mobile phone in our hands, having computers, being able to talk across the globe, thousands of miles away from each other. This is amazing. This does not make us civilized, okay? What makes us civilized is how we look after each other, how we see those that we actually don't understand, how we reach out to them, how we communicate. What do we do? You know, do we stone people to death because they stole a loaf of bread? Or do we actually break the bread in half and say, look, don't steal, but here's a bit and, you know, we can talk about how we're going to work a program for you to be able to feed yourself. So this is some of the reasons why this happens. I mean, obviously, I'm, when I'm talking in general terms, not every European is, evil. I hope I don't have to keep putting qualifiers, not every European is evil, not every African is altruistic and perfect. I'm not saying that. But if we're talking in a historical context, there has only been one collective group of people, the Caucasian consensus, I think people uh, in the Pan-Africanist circle, you know, that rule that who, whoever must be, who rules, we don't even have to like each other, but they must be of European heritage. And we still live under that, that, dogma, that, that, that dogma now. So, you know, the Germans might hate the French, the Americans might hate the British and so forth. But if there's a threat, they come together. And if it, whether it's Iraq, whether it's Afghanistan, you know, whether it's Iran, whatever, whoever it is, you know, they, they target them. And right now, you know, we see what's happening in Russia and Croatia. I'm not going to go into the politics of that, but we're seeing it just continuously going round in cycles. So let, let me just um, say for anyone who might be hearing audio only, that was the voice of brother Dr. Toyan Agbetu, who is joining We Act Radio from London. And I, um, he was answering Kimon Freeman's question about why white supremacy um, persists. And there was certainly a lot to unpack in, in that response. But one of the thing, one of the reasons that I started this series of, of conversations is to highlight some of the ways that violence persists, but white people especially, but not just white people, don't even recognize that it's happening. And um, brother Dr. Toyin describes some of the way that, that Britain is an empire, um, exhibits that, the United States is an empire, exhibits that. It, it was an empire, past tense. <laughs> Past tense, okay. Um, well, we're still out there causing trouble. Uh, both both <laughs> the UK and the US are out there causing trouble as they're though, reformulated. And uh, yes, and um, you know, depending on how you look at empire, we are still well. L L London Bridge is falling down. I think America's days is numbered as well. Okay, so um, I you know I was going to just ask that we shift the conversation a little bit to um, policing, which is one of the things that came up um, in the uh, remark just now. But um, let me ask uh, Kimon if you if that's the direction you wanna go or did you have another question? Well, absolutely, but I do have a follow-up question because he, he made a po point and uh, uh, I, I think it bears repeating that when Nelson Mandela, because first of all, no one uh, comes out of prison uh, been accused of being a terrorist and held for 27 years and become president without a compromise. There's there's deals have to be made in that transition. And part of the transition team was he could not um, um, affect um, any uh, wealth distribution and he could not and he, and he had to forego 
um, um, the, nu uh, the nuclear uh, arsenal because South Africa was a nuclear power during apartheid and they are no longer now. And so, I mean, of course, there was other you know, concessions he made, but those are notable. And so when we talk about the institution of white supremacy, that, that clearly is an enforcement because the real problem is those weapons being in the hands of non-white people. That's the that's 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 what this is really about. Like like we can have it, but you can't have it. <laughs> you know, and and one of the things when you said that uh, white uh, a lot of white people uh, who identify with being white don't recognize white supremacy is not just white people because by and large the majority of people who practice the institutional white supremacy are not themselves white because we see a color caste system everywhere. Colonialism and slavery reared its ugly head. That's global. OK, and so I always like to use this analogy to bring everybody on to, uh, to the same um, um, level of understanding. If you see a, a film and it has a, a complete Latino cast, Latino director, Latino producers, you say that's a Latino film for Latino audiences. If you see an Asian film with an Asian cast, Asian producers, you say that's an Asian film for an Asian audience. But if you see a white film with white actors, white producers, white everything, you say that's just a movie for everybody. That's white supremacy. So we need to understand that how insidious it is. And sometimes we kind of reinforce it with terms like uh, minority. Uh, you know, uh, th those things reinforce the pillars of this institution of inequity. Uh, so I just want to put that out there. And uh, finally, I have to say that um, for my, my brother, John Legend, uh, who was one of the few people who was uh, a friend of the artist formerly known as Kanye West to publicly denounce him. He says that it's weird how all these free independent thinkers always land at the same old anti-blackness and anti-Semitism. OK, yeah. so this is not new. So uh, but I take I, I, I submit to wherever direction we go from here. But I just think that um, they had this culture warrior on the other side of the pond uh, speaking these, what, as he says, uh, my offer truths, you know, um, across the um, the railroad of bones of, of, the, of, of our enslaved ancestors at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean uh, is definitely um, uh, the height of humanization, or as he says, uh, civilization, because uh, the mechanization is destroying the planet and the humanization is going to be the civilization that is going to save it. And these type of conversations are going to move us in that direction. Yeah, no, I, I hear you, Kim. I mean, uh, you know, you, you said so many truths there. I don't even know uh, if, if you've got a specific question you want to address to, because um, I mean, it's good to hear that uh, John Legend has come out and actually made that comment i mean part of the problem um is that many of the i don't really use the term celebrities i tend to call them <clears throat> media personalities i don't like this term stars you know they're not stars they're human beings that are kind of made a lot of success out of a capitalist system but it's good normally um they remain quiet they don't say anything and um you know i think our, our community or many people in the pan-african community had already identified some of the problems of the words that were coming out of Kanye's mouth from a very long time ago and it seems quite tragic. It's only now that he's actually engaged in uh, anti-Semitic uh, reference and, and, and rhetoric that people seem to be taking it very, very seriously. The thing with um, um, Nelson Mandela is a bit tricky. You, you, you really articulate it well in the fact that no one comes out of prison after 27 years and I, I, without making compromise. And I, I was initially quite upset. Um, I was happy that he was out, but I was very upset about the deal. But um, you know, he's an elder, he's an ancestor now. And I don't speak bad of our ancestors. And there's one thing I do know is that when he was a young man, he had fire in his belly. And that's why they put him in that prison. And I know that, you know, there are many people, I, I regard myself as relatively strong-willed. I have a very relatively strong spirit, but I know if you put someone like myself away from my family and my loved ones and my people and my community for 27 years, you know, there's a risk that I'm gonna be broken and so I, I don't know what happened to him inside that time. I'm not going to pretend that I'm happy about what happened. I'm, I'm not. I, I, I think it's one of the most disastrous. That was a moment for real change when he came out, if he came out soul intact. Uh, he didn't. And, you know, the way he treated Winnie afterwards, and there's lots of things we could talk about, but he's an ancestor now. I don't need to do that. You know, you know he's done his bit. He worked to the best capacity. 
but the ramifications, I think there's a book by um, uh, Naomi Klein, um, Shock Doctrine, which talks about some of the, the decisions, the economic decisions that meant that Azania, and Azania is the traditional name for uh, uh, what they, the region that was called South Africa, uh, some of the decisions that keep the structures of impoverishment locked in. And Virginia, uh, the term I often use um, to describe what you was referring to earlier when we took come to violence is structural violence. It's not my term. It comes from a Norwegian philosopher, uh, Johan. Uh, uh, um, Johan, oh God, my brain's gone bad. Um, Johan, I forgot his surname. It's amazing. I'm very tired. Um, and and he he coined this this term, um, structural violence. And it talks about this invisible nature, which, which Kimon was talking about, the way whiteness works, but the way systems of violence uh, cause totally preventable deaths to occur. And that's really the key point, that these deaths are preventable. So whether it's through housing, whether it's through education, whether it's through policing, you know, these deaths do not need to occur. We have the resources, we have the technology, what we lack is the political will, and they're baked into institutions. And people every single day are dying this is structural violence and what came on talk about the normalization of whiteness you know it's the same thing how we normalize structural violence we just shrug our shoulders well that's just always been like that it doesn't have to be like that and that's the work that those of us who have not been caught in this uh stockholm syndrome of white supremacy those of us are kind of like man this universe ain't quite right there's a full fool and i'm gonna i need to smash it um you know that's the that's what we have to break out of and it's a very difficult uh, a war to, to do so because what happens is that your loved ones will start thinking that you're crazy they'll start thinking you're mad because you're saying these things and everyone's saying no but it is just a film for everybody why you got to make everything about race man mm -hmm. you know these are the narratives that we hear you know whiteness is normalized even when we use terminology like um people of color there we go again are not is white not a color so mm -hmm. we just it made white invisible again you know, we, we, you know, we everything in the language is a cultural repository is designed to uphold white supremacy. We're talking in English. You know, we, we shouldn't really be doing that. We, we, we should be, you know, you know, have our own mother tongues. And if we choose to use English as a medium, we do that. But if not, then we learn each other's language and we communicate and we have a richer dialogue. But white supremacy is so normalized in every aspect of what we do. Even when I write, even when I create music, I am enriching the cultural repository of whiteness because I'm my primary language is English. Uh, this is why I have love, this is why I watch what they call world cinema. Because what happens is that, you know, you, you start to learn things where people, the ending's not always happy. You know, it's not always a, a good ending because that's how the world works. Whereas if I'm watching an American film, they do these test screenings. And if the audience are sad, that means they're not gonna get a lot of money. So they rejig the, the endings to make sure the hero always wins. I don't want my children to, to think that. I don't want my community to think that. I want them to see films where they get the real deal so they can formulate real strategies to survive in this world that we're in. So it's not about being pessimistic, but it's about just being real. So I, I want to back up just a tiny bit. And if I if it's possible, I'm going to um, share screen so I can show um, some, some of the tweets that went along with um, this, uh, well, I don't know, maybe that isn't going to work. Um, and I, I, those who are listening uh, won't be able to see it anyway. I'll, I'll put it on. You can, uh, you can, you can state one of the tweets uh, that would work if you could read one of them. Okay. So um, what I wanted to bring up was that right after this, um, weird tweet that um are we supposed to call him ye ye kanye uh, I, I, um after after this tweet from kanye west which i didn't see right away because i i, I, I got some, i got some choice words we can call him but i don't think it'd be appropriate for okay, your program yeah, yeah let's let's not, let's not go right there so it is it um, it happened oh, as far as i know over like the jewish sabbath and then we have the beginning of the holiday of Sukkot, so I'm not on social media. And I came back and saw it and I thought, well, that is just weird. And you know, he like, who cares what he thinks because who cares? But then I saw that there was a whole bunch of um, responses that kept saying black 
anti-Semitism is a problem. Another example of black anti-Semitism. And then I saw a very well-reasoned tweet that said, please don't discuss Kanye's anti-Semitism as if it's particularly common among black people. He expressed anti-Semitism common among conservative white supremacists. And the, uh, the uh, tweeter who is Dr. Mia Brett, someone I don't know, went on to explain that what Kanye was talking about was the theory of uh, Black Hebrew Israelites. It's not really about Black Jews at all. So this is another case where whiteness is partially invisible in Judaism among Jews and among people outside looking at Jews. So there was fighting about, are there people who are Jewish and Black, which of course there are. Are there people who are um, anti-Semites who are Black or not Black? Of course there are, but the making whiteness invisible makes it possible to make this a Black issue, which is is one of the problems that, that we run into. And um, I... Um, there, I, I was going to try to share this this um, set of, set of tweets, and like I said, I will put I'll put them on weactradio.com and read, read. You gotta get you gotta read the tweet so everybody know what we're talking about. You talking okay. about the DefCon three tweet, right? Oh, you want me to actually read that one? Yeah, um, read the tweet so everybody got got the same okay. information. Um, I'm not. I I do have it saved on my computer, and I will pull it up while we're talking. Okay. Um, I, I think Sammy Davis Jr. is rolling over in his grave right now. I think that um, this is an issue of the, the acceptance of anti-blackness is okay, but uh, anti-Semitism is not. And because he was paraded on Fox News as like, as, as, uh, as the anti-black Messiah, but then he 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 goes DEFCON three on the Jewish community, and then all of a sudden he's he's being canceled, you know, uh, in the span of of forty eight hours. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's illuminating, and and we need to acknowledge that as well. But um, I think that you know we sh you know white supremacy denounces um um uh you know both of both cultures you know i mean like that when we talk about the holocaust only two holocausts come to my mind well actually three because uh you want to count the uh, genocide of native americans um but all of that was directed at at, at um um uh, people they dominated with um, the jews mm -hmm. the, the africans the native americans um and i don't and, you know i was just reading a story um with canada apologizing when the pope did his little tour about all they did to beat the um, the Native American out of the indigenous people and force them to accept uh, European um, uh, ideology and, and 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 religion and how that spawned abuse for decades. Um, so uh, I think that Kanye has been up to this point at least rewarded for his willingness um, to pr um, propagate. Um, the tenements of, of white supremacy. Um, and we need to um, definitely um, denounce that. Uh, as as Dave Chappelle would say, the black delegation uh, will release Kanye <laughs> and we can find uh, a much more suitable person <laughs> to switch <laughs> uh, for him. And we can uh, give up Candace Owens and Clarence Thomas while we at it. And if Brother um, Toyin want to add some names to that list, I'm sure there's some more in, uh, in the UK. Look, we, we have plenty, unfortunately, in, in the UK. This is this is the golden era of, um, I don't want to use any childish terms, uh, of, of, of African people who would rather not be. Um, but I, I, let, let me just say something on, 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 on that. Um, I mean, I mean just, just for clarification, I mean, I, I, I don't use the term anti-blackness because I, you know, I don't use racialized language. I, I refer to Afrophobia. So when I say Afrophobia, this is what I'm talking about. I think one of the things that you, that you, you, you touched on, uh, Kimon, you know, and no one actually says it. I've never heard anyone say it. Maybe I need to write this. Is that anti-Semitism was invented by white supremacy? You know, we, we just we just completely forget it. This is the whole thing about whiteness being invisible. Um, you know, Jewish people in Germany weren't doing anything wrong, <laughs> and they democratically elected a leader who decided to go and murk them 
I mean, you know, this is white supremacy. Um, you know, white supremacy you know, invented Afrophobia. African people were in England, for example, before the Angles and the Saxons. We were here, we were trading, we were moving around the world, they knew who we were. Then there was this, this so-called Enlightenment era. And then they decided to invent this, this the discipline that I'm involved in, anthropology, unfortunately, decided to invent race. And along came Afrophobia. And so you talk about the Amerindians, we can go all around the globe. You know, we you know we can look at the Maui. We can we can you know we can look at uh, uh, you know the people in Australia, the indigenous people of Australia. We can look in uh, New Zealand. I mean, we, wherever whiteness has landed, white supremacy has murked uh, or did its best to exterminate the people. Uh, the, the, I think the biggest asset that Africa had was that the, the motherland herself was helping would fight back. So you, you know the European invaders could not survive in the environment. And, and that had a, a major impact in the way that they reinvented their systems of oppression and then started engaging with the, 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 the collaborators, the sellouts, uh, those who were indoctrinated in capitalist ideals and would actually betray their people. Um, but it was white supremacy that did this. The whole Arthur comes about from that. So it's a very complex uh, thing. Kanye it, it, you know, has been promoting Afrophobia uh, throughout his career. I mean, it doesn't matter that he's a musical genius. Um, it's like, uh, you know, Robert Kelly was a musical genius, but when he sings around, I believe I can fly and tries to rehabilitate himself, it doesn't change the fact that he was uh, an abuser. And the respectable, respectable, respectability politics that you spoke about, um, for me, what's, what's heartbreaking for me is that it came from someone that was a really, you know, major impact on me as a child. I grew up in the UK watching uh, The Cosby Show. And I watched, you know, I grew up watching Will Smith in The Fresh Prince. And to hear Bill, Bill Cosby, I'm not going to go into all this stuff about his, his allegations and the prison. I'm not really interested in all that now. But what I do know is that as he became more and more powerful, he was one of those voices that talked down on African-Americans. He used to take the mick out of our names, us trying to find our own culture out of this history of oppression. And this is something that seems to happen to Africans who become conservatives. As they get richer and they get further away from us, they start to think they're better than us. And, you know, I mean, and, and so, you know, I, I know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to conflate this. I know there was a big Ferrari about um, uh, Will Smith and there's a lot of conspiracies about what he did. But actually, he just defended his woman. Did he go over the top? I, I don't know. Would I have done the same thing? Perhaps. I don't know. Is it the end of the world? Well, no, it wasn't. It, on the scheme of violence, was it like, you know, was it like white supremacy? Was it like one of the children that we, right as we're speaking right now, one, one of our babies is being stopped and searched and might be shot. <laughs> is, you know, Will Smith slapping some clown that disrespected his way? Is, is that really the thing we should be focusing on? No, it isn't. And so I have a problem with the clowns. Uh, we have a lot of them who are in the entertainment world who serve white supremacy by being distractions. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a, a different time when hip hop, you know, was was news. You know, when 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 Dead Prez, kind of like you know, even when Public Enemy, kind of you know, I mean, there's a, there's a shift now, but there, there are time when the art. You know, I love art. I love music. I love poetry. You know, the, the Langston Hughes. We, we we you know, we had people who were political. I mean, you, you know, uh, you know, you speak about uh, uh, Dick Gregory. You know, I mean, people going there. Even even Richard Pryor. You know, he used to use the N word. And I, you know, before I knew what the N word was, I used to find him hilarious. And then I found out what it was and I was quite angry with him. And then he went to Africa and he just said, actually, I ain't gonna use, what am I doing? I ain't using that again. I think there was that other comedian who went to South uh, Africa, Zania, what's it, David Chappelle, same thing. I know he's been canceled now. I'm not up to date with all the stuff he's supposed to have said. But what I'm saying is that there's a fusion between art and politics, because this is where we have power. White supremacy, uses money, it uses its resources, and it's effective in co-opting some of our greatest thinkers. And, you know, and what happens, because we, our, our skill set sometimes doesn't manifest itself in the, the written word, you know, in quoting Foucault, or quoting, uh, you know, like, a, you know, a, you know, a, you know, a, a Pierre Bidot, or, or, or some European philosopher, or the John Locke's, uh, you know, because we don't, that's not our thing. I mean, I, I'm a nerd, it just happens to be I'm pretty good at it. What happens if we think that we're not clever enough, that we're not good enough, but we're still standing. And the reason why we're still standing is because we know that the world is wrong. We know that we're supposed to be here. 
And we know that we're actually the front line. Even when we are put right at the bottom of everything, white supremacy knows, and this is, you know, this is not me being uh, troublemaking, but knows that those people who have got nothing to lose also have everything to gain. And so, Kimon, when you say that, you know, uh, you know, the empires of British and uh, American Britain are gone, I don't think they're gone. I think they're still here. They just, they just use globalization and neoliberalism just to hide themselves a bit better. But they have the same historians that we do. And history is very clear about this. Any empire, no matter how strong it is, when the end comes, it comes fast. They don't see it coming. You know, so it could be the Roman Empire, whatever empire it is, they, they, they've got power. Then something happens. It could have been COVID. Something happens which I didn't anticipate. It could be an earthquake. It could be an asteroid. And then all of a sudden, they're gone. And the next not moving. And so what we're seeing with white supremacy is that it's recognized. It's got all the money. It's got all the power. It's got our, it's got our clowns keeping us in control. And so now it's frightened of the geo-global threat of nations like China, you know, of Russia. People who have got, A, military power, who have got economic savvy, but more importantly, they've got love of self. They believe they can achieve. It's what the Haitians had. We wouldn't even be talking about human rights in this world today if it wasn't for those Africans in Haiti who had that revolution. We, we wouldn't even know the concept of free, they, the first African republic. And you can see what America did to it to make sure that there was no contagion. So, you know. Um, I, 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 let, me, let me just um, pause for just, just one second. No Again, worries. For anyone who is only getting the audio, you're listening to brother Dr. Toyan Abetu, who is joining We Act Radio from London. And we are also joined by Kimon Freeman, who is co-founder of We Act Radio and an artist and activist in his own right. And um, we've had a comment that I just thought might be uh, worth noting from uh, another uh program host. Thomas Bird mentions Herschel Walker, and um, that is a, a, a not necessarily an artistic uh, personality, but somebody else who who uh, he mentioned in when you were asking for examples. So I thought I'd, I'd bring that in. And I also wanted to mention um, something that you said in early on in your um, remarks about uh, anti-Semitism being a product of white supremacy. I didn't know myself until fairly recently that like the word anti-Semitic is actually something that was developed by somebody in Germany who thought that it was a good thing to be. Like we we got to get rid of the Semites, so let's be anti-Semitic. And it sounded sort of philosophical and and cleaned up sort of. So I actually, it, it was interesting what you said about you don't want to use anti-blackness because that is a more common um, usage in the U.S. I think, and we do, we are, you know, as they say, divided by a language. Um, but um, I tend to say anti-Jewish because I think anti-Semitism is this thing that people think it sounds knowledgeable or something like and so I don't I don't like to use it but then if you don't use it then you don't know what people are talking about and since I did interrupt I'm going to go ahead and say since Kimon asked me to read it I'm going to read the tweet that caused all this hullabaloo this particular round of hullabaloo he said at I don't uh, October 9th, maybe, or something. I don't know. I am a bit sleepy tonight, but when I wake up, I'm going to go Death Con 3. Um, it's been reported as Def Con, but it's Death Con 3, which makes it sound like some sort of like Comic Con or something. I don't know. On Jewish people, I'm going to go Death Con 3 on Jewish people. The funny thing is, I actually can't be anti Semitic because Black people are actually Jew also. You guys have toyed with me and tried to blackball anyone who opposes your agenda. So um, that's where um, the odd syntax makes people think that he was saying that there are black Jews, which is, of course, a fact. But he was actually using the language of the uh, black Israelites who say that black people are the Jews and that people like me are fake Jews because we're not 
I want to cancel that argument right now because his notion that he couldn't possibly be uh, anti-Jewish, as you say, um, Virginia, uh, because of the Hebrews, um, uh, the validity of that is out the window, even if he's correct. The validity is out the window. Why? Because he's definitely black and he's definitely been promoting anti-blackness. So for him to say that I couldn't possibly be anti-Jewish, dude, you anti-black? Why you can't? <laughs> so why you can't be? You know what I'm saying? So let's move on before um, from that. And on top of everything else, which I think is the most insidious aspect of all of this, is that he has profited from his anti-blackness. He has monetized uh, his support for white supremacy. And, I, and the fact that black people still want to wear his ugly ass comfortable shoes because uh, they love his beats or, or whatever, uh, it, it, it reminds me of those Africans that were sitting there um, uh, uh, singing hymns with the queen. <laughs> you know, let's hold hands, you know. And I think that, you know, if, and for those who are un unaware, DEF CON 3 is a war games term. That means it's like a final stage of, 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 of a, a potential nuclear uh, exchange which would be the final Holocaust if that was uh, to take place. Uh, but uh, I just want to make sure that we, we operate from the place that we understand that this is not just about words, as my brother, uh, Dr. Torrance said, this is, this is about action. This brother has been taking actions and he has enriched himself. I think, so I think he's the worst kind because he's a popular figure and he's sowing dissension and he has millions of people that are now going to be emboldened, just like Trump emboldened these people yeah. to act yeah. upon their ignorance. And so I, I just want to leave it there and I turn the floor back over to you guys. But I also want to make sure that we at some point um, uh, uh, address um, uh, real quick. Um, I'm trying to think of my brother's name because he said Haitian in a, in a job. Oh, Ra uh, okay. the great filmmaker Raul Peck, who did an exceptional job with Exterminate the Brutes. So for your homework, boys and girls, is to go back and watch Exterminate the Brutes, then come back and talk to us. All right, our floor is Thank on. you, Kim. I mean, there's so much. I mean, I, I, I mean, I would ask first of all. I mean, like you know, we've we've spoken a lot about the clown, so it'd be good if we can just wrap up on him. Um, but you're right. Um, you know, he's profited off his Afrophobia. He's he's made money out of it. He's he's got his song. I mean, for me, it's a nightmare to sing a song, night, uh, you know, n words in Paris, and to have thousands of Europeans singing that word at you and putting that energy out into the universe. There's something wrong with you. But then I say that, and I, I and I've cut him a lot of slack because I've heard that there is something wrong with him that he has has some kind of mental issues, um, and so I always cut people slack. But what's happened is it's, it's it's this repetition without any repent, and that statement that came out in the tweet, um, it wasn't DEFCON as in DEF, which is what the military term is, which is a defensive posturing. You know, kind of like, okay, this is the final stage. Like you said, it's a final stage. Nuclear missiles are going to come. DEFCON 3, battle down everything, get the missiles ready to defend ourselves. He actually used the word DEF, as in D-E-A-T-H. So it was a threat towards people who are Jewish. It was in, it, it was, there's no one who can defend it without actually making a fool of themselves. You know, when oh, we talk about, I didn't you know, catch that. Yeah, no, it was DEF. <laughs> And so essentially what it was, it, so there's no one who could say it wasn't anti-Semitic. It clearly was because it was violence against an entire group of people. Okay. So, you know, I, that's why I'm not getting engaged in that di discussion because clowns like Kanye, they, they, they thrive off this. They, you know, they just turn up the volume every, you know, and, and us even see what's happened. Even of us discussing him now, we're not discussing the, the inequalities that are faced by police brutality on the streets. Like death with Chris Cabra in the UK, for example, they eat up our space, not just on, on, on when we, our, our time when we're talking, but our space to analyze issues and our headspace. They mess up with our spirit. And, and what you said about him having that influence over so many young minds is so important. Because music is is key. It's one of our most potent weapons and it's been hijacked. And what happens is that it's been commodified in a way and weaponized in a way that actually we have to have a fight to claim back. And that's another discussion, probably another program for uh, uh, for another day. So that's what I, I, I really want to say um, on that particular issue. You, you spoke about um, what happened in the, in the Abbey. I don't always talk about that. Um, but you identified exactly how I felt. Um, I expected my enemies. I expected the British state, uh, the monarch, 
the, 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 the parliament, the prime minister, I expected them to celebrate, uh, you know, like a, 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 you know, an advocate for enslavement and to try and have this, this sick ritual to uh, to elevate William Wilberforce, the Wilberforce, as we were calling it in the UK and stuff like that. That's what they do, right? It's white supremacy. What hurt me the most on that particular day, um, it, it, it was my family. It, it was knowing that there was 2,000 African people in that space and only four people, no, three people came out with me. That, it took me two years to get over that. The walk was amazing. You know, I mean, you know, I, I love my, my community. I love my pan but pan African community, even though we, you know, th th there's millions of us on this globe, wherever we are, we're still isolated. You know, unfortunately, the stereotype of Hotep brothers haunts us. You know, it's like, you know, some of us are blacker than black, more African than African, and then all this kind of, and it puts people off. But Malcolm was a pan Africanist, Kwame Tura was a pan Africanist, and Kroon was a pan Africanist, Lumumba was a pan Africanist, Queen and Zinga was a pan Africanist, Nana the Maroons was a pan I cannot divorce myself from a revolutionary movement that means that we are here alive to talk. And there's something I remember seeing that I, I have to give credit to you, uh, Kimon. I mean, I saw your name attached to um, uh, a, a film uh, about um, John Brown, and we're close oh. to the anniversary of um, John Brown's uh, birthday. Because in the UK, we have October, which is African History Month. Uh, the only critique, because I don't do wrong and strong, there's a couple of uses of the N-word. And when you put the N-word in it, I can't play it to my children. So that's the thing, I'm very strict on that. So I, I'd, I'd love to have a version with the N-word taken out, but I just loved it. I love the fact that actually we recognize that we have people who are serious about justice who see injustice against another human being and say, you know what, I'm going to step up and do something about it. And what did the, 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 the liberal elite, what did the, what did the education say? What does academia do? Well, it doesn't celebrate him. It doesn't talk about his history. They, they actually make out like he was a madman, when actually what he was doing was he was, he was living up to the convictions of what he said he believed in. And so I know people died. I'm not, I'm, like I said, I'm not someone who advocates violence but I advocate self-defense. I advocate, you know, kind of like self-determination. And so we are in a strange place where we accept structural violence. So we can, we can hear statistics like, you know, X amount of people are homeless and dying on the streets every single year. And we just think, well, you know, and the numbers are going up. Yeah, well, you know, whatever. And then we see one person get beaten up in the police, by the police, and only if it's been videoed, mind you, if it's not being videoed and we can't see it, we're like, yeah, I know. But if we see it, then we feel compelled to say something. You know, it hits us on an emotional level. All of us. I mean, I, if I see brutality physically, it's worse than if I just read it in a newspaper. The problem is, is that we have to be better. We've got to be stronger. We've got to be smarter. We've got to recognize, we, we've got to, there's a phrase my, of a brother of mine says, he says, I'm down with John Brown. And I think we have to recognize that there are times when actually it can't be those who are oppressed, those who are vulnerable, that do all the work. We get burnt out. I'm in my 50s, I'm 55, but I know because, you know, you know, science will tell us, medical research will tell us, I'm 55, but the level of work and the stress that I have to deal with just by being a scholar activist means that internally, I'm probably around 65, 70 now. And that's not healthy, high blood pressure. You know, I'm quite healthy, I don't smoke, I don't drink alcohol, but yet my body is, is being worn out at a faster rate. And so we, we, I do understand why a lot of us say, I ain't get involved in that. You know, I, you know, my, my political participation in, 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 in life is, you know, ticking a box and voting every few years. And that's me done. I'm, you know, I've, 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 I've stood up. I've made my mark. And for other people, it's going out on a protest march. And that's cool. We need solidarity rallies. It, it raises our spirits. But the problem is that leaves only a small amount of us acting like this radio program. We act. You know what I mean? And I'm not talking about react because we are forced often, white supremacy, uh, neoliberalism forces us into a position of reaction. And when we're reaction, it's like my dad used to tell me, when I was very young at school, and I, I just never liked bullies. I read too many comics, right? So I kind of like had this thing. I, I believe it or not, I wanted to be a detective. That was always my dream when I was a young boy. And then the police kept on harassing me and it started beating me up. And I just realized, oh my gosh, as a child, the police are the bad people. I can't join them. And that's how I became an activist. That's one of the parts that started that, 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 that route. I wanted to stop the bad people. And so, you know, what happens now, we're in a position where we, we're continuously reacting, where we need to stop, think, evaluate, plan, strategize, and then act. 
And that means that we need allies. We need people to keep the nonsense off our back so we can just sit down, break bread and think and conceptualize. One thing about the history of enslavement that people don't really think about is like, you know, we have, I mean, there's a film going around right now called The Woman King. I haven't seen it yet. And, and I, you know, some people say it's a great film, some say it hasn't. And I, I intend to see it. And I know it's the people at the homie. But, you know, my, my heritage is Yoruba. My parents came from a place that's named Nigeria. And the Dahomey, uh, the elites in Dahomey were actually involved in collaborating with the Europeans that was enslaving us. So I don't know what that story is going to tell. But if it's like Black Panther, and don't get me wrong, Black Panther was a beautiful romantic image, just like Obama's election was a beautiful romantic image. And I get it, right? You know, Michelle and Obama in the White House, it looks cool. Your heart just beats for the children. I mean, how can you not love that? Symbolism. But did it change white supremacy? Did he not send drones? What, I mean, you know, he, the, the only revolutionary act that would have happened is not if Obama became president, but if an Amerindian became the president, if, a, if an Amerindian had became president of the United States, I would have got on a plane and I would have been there for that inauguration because I would know that there's a change happening. But all white supremacy did was it said, you know, we are Americans. Bush has drained our capital around the world. People think we're clowns because our president is a redneck. How can we do a major PR stunt that will make people love Americans again? I remember the rhetoric when Obama was voted. I don't know if it was oh, in the UK. We were hearing nonsense like, yeah, America's post-racial, man. Post-racial? Yeah, America's like the land of the free. Post-racial, there's no more racism. There's a black prime minister, and look at his wife and his children. Yeah, and Black Lives Matter was born during Obama's administration. <laughs> Thank you. The facts. And, now, and what did America say? America said, you know what? We ain't having the N word in our White House. They went mad. Mm -hmm. And and and, and, and they, also the they... um the highest record of gun sales in America was when he was elected. <laughs> That's a fact. And so well, uh, my brother, I, I know our time is why I know. I just want to um, say before um Virginia takes the mic from me, is sorry. that um Martin Luther King's last book was entitled Um Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. So I want to thank you, my cultural warrior for giving us a Pan-African view of where do we go from here. And I hope this is uh, the first time that we get a chance to build together and not the last time. I, I, yeah, I was gonna, gonna say the same thing. We've just barely started this conversation. And as you say, you know, way too much of it went toward the clown, but I did think we had to, you know, kind of touch on that. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I will say real quick, I live, 14 blocks from the Capitol and the first, and I've been here a long time, 35 years. The first time I was scared, really scared, was right after the election when I was on a public bus and went by the Capitol, which they have now like rerouted the bus so you don't do it, you don't go by the Capitol. And there were these people standing there with with nasty, nasty, ugly signs and just few, like just, it was so, it was so ugly, I was really scared. And people on the bus were too. And um, that was right after Obama's um, election, or maybe it was after he was actually inaugurated. But it was, it was, it was scary. The backlash was bigger than I think too many of us, you know, expected. The, the, the white, the white backlash. Yes, it was it was white people out there saying really nasty things that I won't repeat. Um, and um, I do want we only have about two minutes left, and I do hope you will come back and that Definitely. you know we have to continue to build. And you know, you mentioned at one point that we all share the same history, but we don't actually share the same way of teaching history, and so we have to take control of that too. But we have about a minute and a half, and I anything you'd like to say about your organization or your work that we haven't touched on, please go ahead and then we'll, we'll um, close out at the hour. Look, I, you know, it's not much to say. I want to say thank you for inviting me to the program and having this discussion. Uh, I'm a Pan-Africanist, I'm a scholar activist. Uh, so it means that, you know, I, I don't do wrong and strong. You know, when my community is wrong, I'll say we're wrong, we'll learn from it. Um, and then we move forward, you know, in positive. And, and that's what the galley has been doing. You know, we're human rights centered. Uh, I do lecture. Um, I, I have to fight. I have to, to keep my soul intact because obviously you're inside a university institution. It's a neoliberal institution. It's trying to co-opt you. It's trying to change you. It's a, it's a struggle. But working, uh, you know, out kind of doing the work I do and talking with you know, people like yourself, Virginia and Kimon, it, you know, it's so edifying. It's soul food, and uh, you know, and, and we need to do this more. 
we need to build this bridge. White supremacy keeps us in, in, in little isolated clans and makes us think that our problems are, are, are only our problems and no one else cares, but we care. And I don't want you to know that we do care. And next time we talk, we can talk about uh, what's taking place over there. And I can share what's happened in, 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 in London and we can strategize and we can help others. So just thank you for, for inviting me onto the program. Well, I am um, delighted you were listening to Brother Dr. Toyan Agbetu and Kimon Freeman. I am Virginia Avniel Spatz. This is We Act Radio, and that's going to have to do it for this week. We'll be back in two weeks. Peace. Peace, if you're willing to fight for it. <laughs>